Our second scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has been raised as he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lately, I can't stop thinking about the novel Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. It is set in America after a pandemic has dramatically swept through the world and rendered daily life almost unrecognizable. In the fictional 21st century world of the book, several years after the pandemic, there is no longer any of the technology we now depend on today because the electric grid has collapsed. There is no longer even running water. Mandel has said she wrote this book as a love letter to our modern world to help us grasp just how extraordinary it is that our technology allows us to remain so connected with each other, even when physically we are far apart. Talking about how she got the idea for this story, Mandel recalls visiting an exhibit of illuminated manuscripts at a New York City museum with her mother. She found herself drawn to a small book of poetry from England whose cover had been hand embroidered by the 11-year-old Elizabeth I for her stepmother, Catherine Parr. As Emily and her mother stood gazing at the book, her mother said, this is an artifact of a world that no longer exists. It can feel like we are at the moment living suspended between worlds, a world that no longer exists and a world that hasn't yet come into being. The beginning of the season of Lent just six short weeks ago seems now like a world that no longer exists. And there is the world we are looking toward some unknown amount of time from now when it will be safe or safer to venture out, to gather together, to do the things we think of as part of normal life. But for now, we are living in this strange in-between time, suspended in a way, set apart. And from where we sit, we're not sure what from the world we once knew and loved will endure when the restrictions are lifted. During Lent this year, our sermon series was called All I Know Is This, speaking from the heart about life's big questions. When we came up with the idea for this series months ago, we wanted to talk about discipleship by considering what we know about some of the big topics of life and faith and scripture. What we came up with is best summarized by the litany we've been using every week during this series. All I know is this, being human is hard. Temptation reveals, rebirth 
is possible. Trust upholds. God chooses me. Grief transforms. Betrayal hurts. Love remains. Death is part of life. Hope overcomes. What we sought to do in this series was to distill down to the most foundational elemental truths of our faith, to discern what is left when everything unnecessary burns away. In its own unexpected way, the circumstances of this season, our world consumed by a pandemic, have brought into even clearer view what is most foundational. So many articles and posts have been written about how this pandemic changes everything. But I wonder if what it's really done is help us take stock of what has changed and what is fundamentally unchangeable in our lives. It is as if our whole world has been shaken up, turned upside down, and we are forced to take stock of what remains, of what still matters. Unique to Matthew's account of that first Easter morning is that when the women arrived at the tomb at the first light of day, the earth shook. The earthquake was literal, describing what happened when the angel appeared and rolled the stone away from the entrance to the tomb. But that earthquake was metaphorical as well a sign that something so extraordinary and powerful had happened that it would shake the whole world to its core. But for the women who were there that morning, the fear they felt initially overwhelmed them to the point that they struggled to understand what was happening and what it all meant. Fear, as we know, can be completely paralyzing rendering us simply incapable of moving or thinking or even taking the next step. Just look at the guards. It wasn't the earthquake that immobilized them. It was the angel whose appearance was so terrifying it caused them to faint dead away. The angel knew, though, that what got the women to the tomb that morning wasn't fear. If all they'd been feeling was fear, let's face it, they would have done what the rest of the disciples did and stayed home behind locked doors, hoping that the authorities who arrested and executed Jesus wouldn't come for them as well. Surely grief and fear had gripped these women for days. Not only was their beloved teacher dead, he had been executed by an unjust and corrupt system that had nailed love itself to the cross while it paid off betrayers and let murderers go free. Surely these women were deeply afraid. And yet, something in them compelled them to leave the house at dawn of day to go and see the tomb. What compelled them to the tomb was Hope, hope beyond hope that everything Jesus had said about being raised from the dead, as ridiculous and improbable as it had sounded at the time, might just be true. Knowing that it was a glimmer of hope that got the women to the tomb in the half dark of early morning, the angel wastes no time calling them to action, Come and see, he tells them. Come close enough to look at the tomb and then see it is empty, just like Jesus promised. And then go quickly and tell the others. In other words, don't just stay here with your mouths hanging open. This good news isn't just for you. It's for you to share. In this season of Lent, what we've been looking for is a way to understand discipleship, what it means to follow this Jesus. And in this story, we find what we're looking for, a pattern 
by which to craft our lives of faith. Come and see, then go and tell. But just like gathering materials together to make homemade masks, before we seek to pattern our lives after the come and see, go and tell of the women, there is one thing we cannot do this without, hope. The task of the disciple, writes Christopher Morse, is to be on hand for that which is at hand. To be on hand for that which is at hand. What is at hand today is nothing less than the wonder and mystery of the resurrection. We have to have enough hope to come and see. In other words, we have to have just enough hope to show up. Fortunately for us, showing up to the miracle of the resurrection doesn't require us to leave home. It doesn't even require us to be without fear or sorrow, for surely the women that day had plenty of both. What showing up requires is hope, which is allowing for the slimmest possibility that what God has promised us might just be true. Yes, it's a promise fulfilled in Jesus, but Jesus isn't the only bearer of this promise, for this promise stretches back to the first moment in time when God, in an outpouring of love, created the whole world, the whole universe. It stretches back to the God who created human beings in God's own image and made them for one another because it was not good for them to be alone. It goes back to the God who heard the cries of people enslaved by an unjust ruler and who set those people free. It goes back to the God who sent prophets to teach us what it means to live according to God's laws of justice and righteousness and loving kindness. Prophets like Isaiah, who painted these extraordinary images we heard in the first reading today of God's promises fulfilled. A feast of rich food and fine wine and the God who swallows up death itself and comes near enough to us in our suffering to wipe away every tear that falls from our eyes. What Easter teaches us this year and every year is not that everything has changed, either because of the miracle of the resurrection or the tragedy of the current pandemic. What Easter teaches us is that nothing changes everything. For what has been true since the first moment of creation was truly confirmed at the morning of the resurrection and is still true to this very day. God is with us. God is for us. God's love upholds us. There is nothing in the world that God's love cannot overcome, not pain or suffering, not death or separation. If we can hold on to this, the promises of God that do not change, but hold true in all circumstances and in every moment, we can have just enough hope to rise up, even on the most difficult of days, to come to the stone cold tomb, to see that yes, it's empty, just as he promised. And then to do what Jesus tells us to go quickly and tell everyone we meet this great good news. Love is real. God is here. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.